The Mimic Creatures and Complete Franchise Explained. Narrated by Andrew Lapamardo. Most of you probably know Guillermo del Toro for some of his popular hits like The Shape of Water and Pan's Labyrinth. But way before his success as an established filmmaker, he broke into the American film industry with a horror creature feature called Mimic. This sci-fi flick was released to some positive reviews, but the box office collection did not do justice to this exciting narrative. However, with time, it did gain a cult following that was enough to ignite a direct-to-video franchise with Mimic 2 and Mimic 3, Sentinel. By then, Del Toro had moved ahead in his career and was working on superhero hits like Hellboy and Blade 2, and he had no involvement with the sequels. His love affair with memorable creatures is well known, and Mimic was no exception. We were horrified by the Judas breed, an insect created for the right purpose, but one that underwent a metamorphosis and became something terrifying. In this video, we will take you through a quick recap of the engaging and thrilling Mimic movies and explore the morbid creature in detail. If bugs don't scare you, wait till you see this human-sized insectoid. Before we go into our explanation, we have a very small request. If you like our content, please support us by subscribing to our channel. This is a small click for you, but for us, it means a lot. Thank you. Let's begin. Mimic, 1997. The movie opens in an apocalyptic scenario, where the city of New York has been ravaged by a deadly epidemic. The disease is wiping out an entire generation of children, and all the efforts to find a vaccine have failed. However, Scientists have learned that the disease is spread by the common cockroach. Dr. Peter Mann seeks the help of an entomologist, Dr. Susan Taylor, and she has the perfect cure for the problem. She develops a new species of insect called the Judas breed, which has been genetically engineered to secrete an enzyme that would poison cockroaches. These insects would not be able to reproduce and they would die within 180 days. In wiping out the roach population, we call it the Judas. With time, they slowly get rid of the epidemic. And Susan marries Dr. Mann. She does have some second thoughts regarding how she manipulated the DNA of the Judas breed. But her husband assures her that it was the only option for them. The plot moves ahead three years later, and we see a preacher being pursued by a tall, thin man in a long overcoat. He seems to be petrified and runs to the roof of a rundown church building. Ultimately, he falls to his death, and his dead body is dragged away into a nearby storm drain. A 10-year-old autistic boy named Chewie watches all this from his apartment, but he is not aware enough to raise an alarm. The next morning, police officers discover that a group of illegal immigrants were locked up in a basement and infected with yellow fever. Dr. Mann heads to the spot, and they decide to set up an immediate quarantine. But Peter and his assistant Josh find something else while looking through the church basement. There are clumps of feces fastened to the ceiling and hanging down from it. Peter is a bit worried because there is a connection between the subway tunnels and the basement passageways. Josh gets a sample for analysis, and it is later found out that the sample had buttons from human clothing. Something alarming is about to unfold. Buttons? Maybe they needed fiber. <laughs> Susan is working in her lab when two kids bring her some unusual bugs. One of these bugs is quite unique, and while Susan examines it, it bites her ferociously. She manages to free herself and stabs it with a pin. After tending to her wounds, she finds out that the bug is secreting some frothy liquid. And this reminds her of the Judas breed. A small litmus test confirms her worst fears. And she realizes that they are indeed identical. Suddenly, she discovers that the bug is gone. And as she searches for it on the floor, 
We are shocked to see a tall, thin intruder clinging to the ceiling and watching her. He is gone in a gust of wind, and the bug is nowhere to be found. When man hears about the incident, he simply feels that Susan has overworked herself and is seeing things. Susan, however, is concerned about the Judas breed, because if these modified insects are somehow alive and reproducing, it might mean trouble. So what happened? The one I examined today was a baby. They were designed to die. They are- The next day, the boys take them to the subway where they found the insect. They end up outside a door that is locked, and the boys claim that it wasn't that way when they went through it the previous time. Peter and Susan in the lock and enter an abandoned room only to be interrupted by an officer working with the Manhattan Transit Authority named Leonard. He is determined not to let them take a look in the area without a proper permit, infuriating Peter. As they argue, Susan awaits on the subway platform and watches Chewie imitating her tapping with his spoons. He can imitate the tapping sounds made by all the people there. She watches his wire sculptures, and when she appreciates them, he shows her his recent work. The one that looks exactly like the bug she had in her lab. In the meantime, the two young boys have ventured into the subway, hoping to find the thing Susan was looking for. They happen upon it, but also discover something else. Overcoat Slim, the humanoid monster, is lurking down there, and kills them both in a gruesome manner. Susan meets a professor who tells her that it could be possible that the Judas breed bugs survived. However, even he adds that under the hopeless circumstance, there wasn't much that could be done. The next scene takes us to Chewie, who is watching the deserted church from his bedroom. He catches the same tall, thin man go inside, and he follows him after leaving his house through the fire escape. He always called the man Mr. Funny Shoes. And even now, he mimics his clicking sound with his spoons. Only this time, he is flanked by two of them. And his expression changes from joy to fear. Remy takes Susan to a sewage treatment plant and her friend brings out a tray that has the head, thorax, and two sets of legs of a man-sized bug. Susan asks her to deliver the carcass to the professor and heads off to meet Peter at the subway. Chewie's father goes looking for him and goes into the church after finding his wire figures inside the doorway. Peter is accompanied by Leonard and Josh as they explore the subway access tunnels. When Leonard spots a large bug like the one in Susan's lab, he squishes it with his feet and it cannot be examined anymore. Peter is enraged and they have a heated argument when suddenly the balcony beneath them collapses. They cannot climb back up, so Josh goes to the upper level to bring some help where he is killed. <laughs> Meanwhile, Susan meets the tall, thin man on the subway platform while she waits for Peter. She realizes that it is a fully grown, man-sized Judas adult. And, even though she tries to run away, the creature gets to her and carries her off into the tunnel. When Susan wakes up, she finds herself in an area full of Judas victims, some of which are dead and rotting. She tries to escape, but falls through a manhole. Luckily, Chewie's father, Manny, finds her while looking for his son. He also finds Leonard and Peter while trying to get help for Susan. And together, they save her from the manhole. However, luck runs out for them, and they are spotted by another Judas adult. They escape into an old subway car, but the Judas adult forces its way inside before the door closes on it, cutting it into half. But... Even the half that got inside the compartment fatally injures Leonard. Now, the smell of blood draws in more of the Judas, and they swarm all over the car. Susan uses a razor to cut open the scent glands of the dead bug, and smears it all over the window to fool the crazed adults. They realize that there might be a chance to fix the old subway car and get away. 
Peter heads out to restore the power line, and Manny tries to throw the track switch and search for Chewie a little longer. He does find Chewie, unhurt, and Chewie even regards the bugs as his friends. He refuses to go with Manny, and just then a Judas adult descends and rips Manny to shreds. When Peter and Manny don't return for quite a while, Susan goes looking for them, and discovers a shocked Chewie, who just witnessed his father die. She takes Chewie with her, throws the track switch, and searches for Peter. When Peter turns on the power, Leonard manages to start the car briefly, but his wounds have worsened, and there is way too much blood. The bug scent will not be enough to mask it now, and Leonard knows that he is doomed. He heads down the track to attract the bugs away from the others, his sacrifice buying them time. <laughs> Peter is finally reunited with Susan and Chewie, and he advises her to take Chewie and escape. He will try to destroy the colony of Judas Bugs, and if he fails, Susan would be there to warn the authorities. Peter manages to ignite an explosion and somehow plunges into the water just before the flames can reach him. The colony should be devastated by the fire, but the breeding male Judas is still after Susan and Chewie. Susan tricks him into walking in front of an oncoming train, and he is squished on the severity of the impact. Later, we see Susan and Chewie huddling on a bench outside the subway entrance. She learns about the devastating fire, and believes that Peter must have perished in the flames. As if on cue, they watch a tall man climbing up the subway stairs, wrapped in a blanket. Chewie seems very happy to see him, and blurts out his shoe size and its kind. We see that the man is Peter, and he embraces them both as we get to experience a happy ending of sorts. The movie is packed with exciting moments, and some of the scenes are bound to send shivers down your spine. Even though Harvey Weinstein interfered a lot, Guillermo del Toro had his way for the most part. Initially, it was supposed to be a 30-minute short film as part of a series of sci-fi horror comedy shorts by Miramax. Even the other segments, like Alien Love Triangle and Imposter, became proper features. This was clearly the best work in the franchise, but the sequels were not too disappointing either. Mimic 2, 2001. This movie was directed by Jean Dezagonzac, because, by now, Del Toro had become a big shot. It was a direct-to-video sequel, and the story is premised four years after the events of the first film. Three men are found dead, and their bodies have been mutilated beyond recognition. Even their faces have been removed, and these bodies have been strung up among the high-tension wires of New York. Detective Klasky, who is investigating the case, finds a link between all the victims. They all knew Remy an entomologist who works as a teacher at a high school. With no other leads in the case, the detective finds her to be a prime suspect in the murders. However, she has no role to play in these hideous killings. Detective Klasky soon discovers the real truth when he comes across an intelligent shape-shifting creature that has been stalking Remy for quite some time. It wants to mate with her for some unknown reason, and this mutant insect can take the face of its previous victim. Remy gets trapped inside the school premises with a couple of her students and Detective Klasky, with the creature trying to hunt them down. Remy gets separated from the group, but when she runs into the creature, it shows no intentions of hurting her. Instead, it is rather interested in and even tries to please her by giving her a slice of pizza. To make matters worse, a militant leader known as Dark Suit is preparing to attack the school with a deadly poisonous gas. Detective Klasky foils the plan, and his heroic efforts set everyone trapped in the premises free. However, there is a shocking twist in the tale. Later, the inspection team discovers the creature's recently vacated form. And 
the mangled corpse of the detective. It turns out that the creature managed to impersonate Klasky, and it was caring for Remy to fulfill its own purpose. However, Remy does manage to get the better of the monster, and finally beheads it to her apartment. The only problem now is that the creature has transformed into a cockroach, and it can survive up to two weeks without a head. Now, Remy and her students just have to figure out how to deal with the situation. Yes, you are absolutely right if you think that this sequel does not quite mimic the brilliance of the original. However, it was intended to be no more than a guilty pleasure, and that purpose is certainly fulfilled. The plot tries to do a bit too much, and we still don't know why a giant genetically altered bug falls for a high school teacher. The one good thing about this movie is when the giant bug man attacks, and there is plenty of gore and terror. Overall, this is just a run-of-the-mill monster fest, but one that is good enough for a movie night. Mimic Sentinel 2003 Sentinel takes a clear turn from the action horror tone of the previous films, becoming more Hitchcockian in its approach. The story uses the same Judas breed monster from the original film, but in a new avatar. The plot revolves around a sickly 24-year-old man, Marvin Montrose. He is a survivor of the deadly disease that plagued New York many years ago. He is severely asthmatic and allergic, and as a result, he remains confined to his bubble apartment room. This makes him bored with nothing much to do. He snoops on his neighbors in the next building, and often takes a few snaps of them. Suddenly, the decaying neighborhood is rife with some mysterious disappearances. A boy is missing in the locality, and later, a local drug dealer named Desmond vanishes as well. Can you guess who has the answers? Our friendly neighborhood voyeur, Marv begins to suspect a strange garbage man, and his lens is fixed on his movements most of the time. His sister Rosie and her friend Carmen offer some support in the investigation. They come across a shocking discovery when they find out that the Judas breed monster is far from extinct. They are back with a vengeance, and people in the neighborhood are falling prey to their insatiable hunger. Marv Cameron and Rosie must destroy the monster roaches for good if they are to save themselves and the people in the locality. The film shamelessly rips off bits of the classic thriller Rear Window, and clearly, the director, J.T. Petty, is no Hitchcock. While the attempt falls flat, it is certainly a unique effort. Most of the action is seen through the photographs taken by Marv, and with time, the film boils down to an interesting climax. There are some surprisingly brutal gore scenes, and the unusual pacing of the movie makes them stand out all the more. Casting veteran actor Lance Hendrickson was a good move, and the other members of the cast also deliver impressive performances. For us, Sentinel is better than Mimic 2, but it could have been a lot better with a different execution. What are the Judas Breed? Now that we have spoken so much about the Judas Breed monster, let's take a closer look at the mysterious creature. It was a genetically engineered bug species that was designed to kill the disease-spreading cockroaches. New species to be our six-legged ally in wiping out the roach population. They were supposed to die out within 180 days, but outside the lab, they learned to survive and adapt. They developed a mind of their own and mastered the art of blending in with humans to stay unnoticed and hunt their prey. They started hunting humans as well when the opportunity was there. And, with time, they even developed the skills to use human faces to enhance their disguise. Initially, they found it difficult to mix with the crowds. But once they took over Leatherface's idea, things got easier. The insectoid bug was extremely powerful and vicious, and if their attacks are any indication, they are quite ferocious as hunters. What the 
Their creator, Dr. Susan Taylor, had no idea about their menacing nature, and she only created them to cure New York City from a devastating epidemic that was becoming uncontrollable. These bugs, called the Judas breed, were supposed to release an enzyme that would kill the cockroaches, and the plan worked. However, once they evolved uncontrollably, stopping them wasn't easy. They were so quite intelligent, and some movies in the franchise explored their capability to work strategically. The original finished them off with a massive explosion, but the sequel would claim otherwise. Either way, the Judas Breed is certainly one of the most dreaded monstrosities in cinematic history, and their antics surely spooked the heck out of us while we were watching the movies. Future of the franchise. We are thrilled to learn that the franchise, which has been long dead, will receive another shot in the arm. As per reports, Miramax Television is working on rebooting the 1997 cult horror flick as a TV series. Paul W.S. Anderson is going to be the director and co-producer, alongside his producing partner Jeremy Bolt. Since they intend to make this into a TV series, we just hope that they add more dimensions to the story and the complications. Mimic was fairly simple, and spread out in a long-form television format, things might get boring. The makers have expressed excitement over the project, and they also added that it'll be a bold new take on the classic. However, given that Paul Anderson and Jeremy Bolt have previously created the Resident Evil franchise, we certainly have low hopes for this new Miramax project. And if you liked our content, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe to us if you haven't already. Have a good one and be safe. Thanks everyone.